Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Walter, and thank you all very much. It's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you here to the White House. You're lucky that I've been told to keep this short, and uh, I'm thinking of a story about ancient Rome, and maybe if some of you've heard me tell it, pretend that you haven't, because I'm going to tell it again. It seems that on a Saturday afternoon in the Colosseum centuries ago, the little group of victims were huddled down there on the floor of the Colosseum, and then the lions were turned loose to come in and devour them, and the lions came out roaring. And one member of the little group down there stepped forward and said a few quiet words, and the lions laid down. Well, the crowd was enraged. They weren't going to see the show that they had come to see. Caesar sent for the man and had him brought before him and asked him, what did you say that made the lions act like that? He said, I just told them that after they ate, there'd be speeches. <laughs> and, well, my words today will be few, but my message is big. We're gathered here because of a library, yes, but because of something more as well. This administration has championed the proposition that there's much in American life that is done best when government is not involved. When citizens from all walks of life chip in and on their own, get the job done. The Library Foundation and your role in it are examples of the truth of that proposition. Of course, the, this belief is ours, not a, of ours, I should say, is not a new idea. Over a century and a half ago, a Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, came to this country to find out what was the secret of our sudden growth and prominence. And he wrote in a book when he went back in Democracy in America, that joining together without waiting for government was one of the most striking features about American life. And he wrote in his book about things that had taken place here. He said that someone would see a need and he would cross the street and talk to a neighbor and the next thing you know a committee would be formed. And he added up with the line and he said, and you won't believe it, but no time was the bureaucracy ever involved. Well, two decades ago, Richard Cornell called our attention to this old, but by then, long overlooked truth in his landmark work, Reclaiming the American Dream. In the last six and a half years, we've made private sector initiatives one of our main centerpieces. To give you one example, not many people are aware of this, but our job training partnership is a private sector initiative. And it is also one of the most successful, perhaps the only successful, national job training program in our history. There's a spirit here, an American spirit. If you ever saw Gary Cooper in Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, you may remember when he said, from what I can see, there will always be leaders and always be followers. It's like the road out in front of my house. It's on a steep hill. And every day I watch the cars climbing up. Some go lickety split up that hill on high. Some have to shift into second and some sputter and shake and slip back to the bottom again. Same cars, same gasoline, yet some make it and some don't. And then he said, and I say the fellows who can make the hill on high should stop once in a while and help those who can't. That's all I'm trying to do with this money, help the fellows who can't make the hill on high. Well, that was Gary Cooper in Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. Helping the other fellow, well, that's the spirit I'm talking about. I want to tell you one thing along these lines that makes me proud. I've talked frequently about how democracy and free enterprise have found new youth and strength around the world during our administration. And it's also true, maybe even more true, of this spirit of helping your neighbor. In the past year, there have been two conferences in Europe between Americans involved in private sector giving and Europeans particularly in Britain, France, and Italy. The response has been remarkable. In Britain, for example, some companies have begun to contribute a per percentage of their profits to charity. Others have started payroll deduction programs so employees can give to nonprofit causes. In France, the Christian Dior Company celebrated its 40th anniversary by contributing a percentage of its profit to charity. 
And in Italy this year, businessmen, along with my Board of Advisors on Private Sector Initiatives, organized a Private Sector Initiatives Conference that coincided with my trip to Venice for the Economic Summit, and I was asked to address them after the summit had closed. Incidentally, I found out that one of the first things that joint Italian-American committee had done was raise the money privately to create, there in Venice, an Italian-American friendship park. But they've gone on from there. Here in this White House, in the very next room, at a dinner one night, my dinner mate was a wife of an ambassador of a European country. I won't embarrass her by telling which country. And at the table, the conversation had gotten around to one of our programs, whether it was United Fund or any of the great things that we do privately. And she quietly said to me, yes, in America, but you must remember, you're unique. And I said, what, what do you mean, what, unique? She said, yes, in America, your people do things like that. But she said, in all our other countries, in the rest of the world, we just think those things are to be done by government. Well, now we've made a, we've made a change in that, but she caused me to do a lot of thinking. Milton Friedman has reminded us that the first social responsibility of business is making a profit. Well, that's true. It's also true that the best environments for economic growth are those in which government is the least intrusive. And that means there are some burdens that others must be ready to shoulder. Americans are leading a worldwide movement of caring for the other guy. It's a movement whose motto could be, love thy neighbor. And it's a movement that has built and run thousands of hospitals, schools, refuges for those in need, and yes, libraries. Before I finish up, I thought I'd tell you about something that happened over the summer. But I think maybe you, most of you have heard about it. I don't think I'm bringing you any news. A little town, Saragossa, Texas, and a tornado ripped through that town, killed 30 people, and destroyed three quarters of the buildings. Many of those left homeless were poor. And Mrs. Natividad Ramirez and her husband, Frank, were among them. And Mrs. Ramirez has said, for a while, we didn't think we'd see a house again. The town was gone. But then 500 volunteers, most of them members of a group called the Texas Baptist Men, showed up. And with materials provided by the Red Cross, they began rebuilding. In a single weekend, they put up 20 homes. And again, this was all with volunteer labor. Well, that's what I'm talking about. And that's with spirit that we want to see grow stronger and stronger. And that way, all Americans will be able to lay claim to the American dream. To speak of the library again, the presidential libraries, if you ever stop to think, yes, I'm personally, in a sense, going to benefit. I'm certainly going to be greatly honored to have such a thing. But they are the one source in this land of actually being able to find out everything about an administration and the history of our country. Can you imagine what it would be like if you had to go to the files of the newspapers to look it up? <laughs> I'd be impeach impeached in an absentia. <laughs> that were done. But it, uh, they, they do serve a purpose. And I am so encouraged, and I think we're maybe setting a, a new a style in the fact that now, thanks to the generosity of a citizen, ours is not going to be associated with a single institution, but is going to be available for other institutions of higher learning who may want to hold a conference that would be worthwhile and be a contribution and any of them would be welcome uh, in that library. I don't know that all of the things of the presidency are going to be revealed in there. Certainly all the papers and all the correspondence, even the personal correspondence, will be on file. And some of that's pretty wonderful. But little things like a diplomatic incident here in this very room, the state dining room, uh, probably won't be there. If not, I'll put it in a book. It was the state dinner for President Francois Mitterrand of France and his wife. And down in the East Room at the other end, we have the reception line. And they then all come down here, and there are 10 tables, not a table like this, 
ten tables scattered around the room here. When we get to the door over there, we follow them down. When we get to the door, everyone's standing in place. Nancy takes President Meade around over there to a table on that side of the room. And that's new, too, and I thought it was a pretty good idea. They always used to put the guests of honor and the president and his wife all at one table, and we thought we'd scatter it around like he did if it was a private party. But then I come through the tables with Mrs. Meade around to a table over here in front of the fireplace. Well, it had gotten that far. Nancy had gone with him, and Mrs. Meteran was just standing. And I leaned out and said to her, no, we go through, and the butler was ahead of her, motioning her on. And she said something quietly to me in French, which I didn't understand. And again, I did the motioning and so forth. And she just stood, and just then the interpreter caught up with us. She was telling me I was standing on her gown. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as I say, maybe some things like that won't be in the library, but that won't do anything to the national conscience uh, if they aren't. But I'm so grateful to all of you for what you're doing in helping in this because it couldn't take place. Uh, without, can you imagine what would be wrong with it if government did it? Uh, you'd have to worry whether you were getting the true story or not. No, this is the only way to have it done and done properly. And uh, I'm so grateful to you that I just can't say. I know I'm talking longer than I'm supposed to here, but could I tell you another little story about those early days? Just one. <laughs> I, I thought after eight years as governor of California that there was an awful lot about this job that wasn't new, that I was familiar with. But one day, a well-known columnist here in town with a farm in Virginia invited Nancy and me to come down to his Virginia farm. So the helicopter landed on the south lawn. We got in, and a half an hour later, we're there at his farm. And as we're walking into the house, he said something surprising to me. He said, your fellows have been here all week putting in the phones. And I said, what do you mean, putting in the phones? I discovered then I can't go anyplace without their putting in White House phones. And they explained to him that I must be able to contact anyone in the world in instantly. So he said that he challenged them on that. And they said, well, name someone. And he named his son, who was a Marine guard in an embassy in Africa. And sure enough, they got the guard on the phone, and his wife got to talk to her son she hadn't seen for many months and so forth. And then uh, he uh, named another one, his other son, the quartermaster on a destroyer in the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. And they said, well, no, we can't reach him. Oh, well, he said, you said, oh, they said, no, no, the fleet is on maneuvers. And when the fleet is on maneuvers, only the White House can reach them. Well, I heard that. We got in the house, and the first person I met was the young man's wife. She hadn't seen her husband for half a year. He was over there. I excused myself and went back out and said, is this right that I could get Quartermaster Kilpatrick on the USS Pratt? And they, oh, they said, yes, sir. I said, get him. And I went back in and got his wife. She got to talk to her husband. But I hadn't thought things through very well. First, I hadn't even thought out that the last part of that call is going to have to go by radio, open to anyone to listen. And a few weeks later, I got a letter from him. And in the letter, he was thanking me and telling me what it was like. And he said, when we're on maneuvers, the air is filled with radio tra traffic. Uh, amb or, uh, <laughs> admirals talking to other admirals and ships talking to ships. Then he said, a voice came on and said, White House calling. And another voice said, what code is that? And a third voice said, maybe that's no code. <laughs> and he said, even, the, even Hollywood could not have silenced the air as quickly as it was silenced. <laughs> then he said they came down to a lowly quartermaster on a tin can and told him that his wife was on the phone to talk to him. <laughs> and he said, and I went up and got to talk to my wife. And then he added this line, which has remained with me forever. He said, it was as if... God had called the Vatican and asked for an altar boy by name. <laughs> he now signs his, we correspond, and he signs his letters to me, your altar boy. <laughs> well, listen, I've been here too long and violated my promise not to keep you too long, but I'm going into the blue room where we started this thing today. And while I've had a chance to greet some of you, not all of you, and uh, you're going to come by and I'm going to get individually to say a hello and a thank you to all of you for what you're doing, but God bless you all. Thank you.